So welcome, welcome. This afternoon, we're in this session to talk about inclusive justice for individuals with complex needs, innovations, adaptations, and collaborations. My name's Lucy, of course, I'll be one of the moderators for this session. My colleague, Katie Peterson is here as well. Katie, I don't know if you wanna pop off and say hello uh, or pop onto the screen and say hello. Um, we are your moderators for the session, of course. Okay, so in terms of housekeeping, I wanted to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen. We're gonna ask that you use the chat feature to submit questions. And I will demonstrate, as this is not at every session that you go to. Um, so when you type in a question, we are asking you to use large caps question, type question here. This will make it easier us, uh, for us to scan through the questions and to be able to have the Q and A session at the end. Okay. Also, please ensure your microphone is on mute until the Q&A portion of the session. We'll have about five minutes for questions. Um, we may not have time to have every question answered, so please be assured that we can communicate um, beyond the end of today. And if you have a question that is in the chat, we'll make uh, best efforts to get those answered for you if they don't get answered in the session. Uh, please note that this session is recorded. You likely saw the notification at the beginning. So this is for the purposes of uploading to the conference website for future viewing by those who have registered for the conference. So you will be able to access this platform for 90 days after today. Uh, if the presenters have documents for you as participants, uh, they will be available in the session page Links will be there and the copy of the slide deck, of course, will be available after the presentation. Uh, we do kindly ask that you complete a short evaluation at the end of the session. Your feedback is really appreciated and it helps us to inform future events such as today's conference. And lastly, for housekeeping, we want to respectfully ask all of those attending today's session to engage with each other thoughtfully and always consider the impact of your words and interactions on others. As moderators, we will not tolerate abusive or inappropriate behavior, and we will ensure anyone uh, who engages in such behavior is removed uh, from this session. So with that, I will introduce you to our presenters uh, by sharing that your team here is from the Clinical Justice Program, operating out of the Community Networks of Specialized Care Central East. Going to turn it over to Marnie, who is going to introduce the rest of the team. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, Katie, as well. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our talk about inclusive justice for individuals with complex needs, where we will be talking about innovation, adaptations, and collaborations. So this talk is brought to you in partnership between CLH Developmental Support Services as well as Mackenzie Health Center for Behavior Health Sciences, and as Lucy stated, the Community Networks of Specialized Care Central East. So my name is Marnie Lai, and I am really happy to be here presenting with my wonderful team. Uh, we have Vicki Simos, Courtney Hudson, and Samantha Earhart. Can we pop to the next slide? Thank you. So we just wanted to begin by sharing in a land acknowledgement together. CLH Developmental Support Services would like to acknowledge that our offices and supported living homes are located on land, which is the traditional and treaty territory of the Anishinaabeg people, now known as the Chippewa Tri-Council, comprised of Beausoleil First Nation, Rama First Nation, and the Georgina Island First Nation peoples. We are very grateful for the opportunity to continue to use this land toward working for the benefit of all people. So just a little quick run through of what we're gonna be doing over the next hour together. We're gonna to start with a kind of a general overview an umbrella look at the community networks of specialized care in Central East. So our network as a whole, and then we're gonna get a little bit more specific and we're gonna talk about the dual diagnosis justice coordination role or the DDJC, which you may hear it referred to. 
And then from there, we're going to talk about a really interesting program, the Clinical Justice Program, which our two DDJCs have developed with the support of some other clinical specialists. And then we're going to jump into a case study, which will help you see where these innovations and adaptations and collaborations can all work together. And then we'll close off by providing you with some resources and tips hopefully some helpful takeaways so that we can all ensure that we're using our best practices when we're supporting um, individuals. Thank you. So as promised, starting off with the Community Networks of Specialized Care Central East. So we have a number of different positions and specialties within our network. As you can see, we're a small but mighty team. And uh, at the top, as our supervisor, we have our network manager, Marnie McDermott. And then we have our administrative assistant, Joanne, whom all of us would be lost without. We also have two complex support coordinators on our team who assist individuals with complex needs. Uh, we have Selena, who covers the York and Simcoe areas. And then we have Melanie, who's working within Durham and HKPR. Uh, HKPR stands for the Halliburton, Kawarthas, and Pine Ridge areas. Then as stated, we have two dual diagnosis justice coordinators or DDJCs. That's Vicki covering York and Simcoe and Courtney covers Durham and HKPR. And then we have me, I'm Marnie, the Justice Adapted Dialectical Behavior Therapy Specialist. We're also lucky to have two healthcare facilitators who work with individuals with complex medical needs. We have Whitney and Sandra, Whitney covering York and Simcoe and Sandra covering Durham and HKPR. We also have one specialized transition coordinator by the name of Cindy, and she helps individuals who are transitioning um, perhaps from uh, an alternate level of care in a hospital back into a community setting. So some of those specialized transitions, um, and she covers all of Central East. And then last but certainly not least with us here today, we have Samantha Earhart, who's our justice specialist and behavior consultant. Next slide, thank you. So just a quick little overview and a visual for you so that you can kind of see how an individual might connect to the community networks of specialized care. So generally what would happen is a referral would come through Developmental Services Ontario or DSO in the Central East region um, to our network. Uh, if people aren't familiar with DSO, they are the centralized access point for any funded adult developmental services in Ontario. Um, so what would happen is if an individual connected with DSO requesting a service like the complex support coordination or the dual diagnosis justice coordination or healthcare facilitator, that referral would then be triaged by the connections lead at DSO with Marty McDermott, our network manager. And then if that individual or that referral request meets the mandate, then that referral would then be sent and linked to the appropriate member of our team. The only time we really deviate from this referral process is if an individual is looking to connect with a specialized transition coordinator who, as I stated with Cindy, in those cases, because that is a, a specialized supporter request, generally those requests go to Cindy first, and then Cindy would then triage it with Marnie and then if the referral meets the mandate and, and Cindy has the capacity to support and assist, then the linkage would then be uh, submitted through DSO. So that is sort of the general process of connecting to the team. If we could pop to the next slide. Now for the sake of our talk today, because we're justice focused, I'm gonna pass it over to Vicki and she's gonna talk a little bit about the dual diagnosis justice coordination role specifically. Thank you, Marnie. So as Marnie, as stated, uh, there are two DDJCs for the Central East region, myself who covers York and Simcoe and Courtney Hudson, who covers Durham and HKPR, Halliburton, Kortha Lakes and Pine Ridge. I'm gonna use the acronyms moving forward. <laughs> These are the courthouses that I cover to support individuals with a developmental disability or dual diagnosis, Collingwood, Barrie, Aurelia, Bradford, Midland and Newmarket. And Courtney Hudson, my counterpart, covers Lindsay, Minden, Peterborough, Coburg, and Oshawa. And so for the dual diagnosis justice coordinator rule, we assist individuals no matter at what stage of the justice system they're at. So it could be first point of contact with police or at risk of justice involvement all the way to 
probation or post-sentencing. Um, we do this uh, by using a biopsychosocial approach and principles of applied behavior analysis, ABA, when needed or, or applicable. Um, and we'll speak more to this support later on in the presentation. And the second point, cross-sectoral partnerships and planning. Um, it is sort of um, a theme or a multidisciplinary sort of team or approach that we've been hearing over the last two days. Um, and our last speaker sort of uh, said, everyone on board. And I, I wrote it down because I think it's um, very important to not work in silos and, and work together as a team um, for the common goal and to reduce recidivism, recidivism for the clients that we support. Um, and so just recently, um, my counterpart, Courtney Hudson, was actually approached by the, P the Peterborough Community Support Court um, to be offered an opportunity to have our program highlighted in their court supports. And this is huge for our program because we're seen sort of as the liaison between community supports and justice professionals or court supports, um, but we're not funded by MAG. So we're trying to raise awareness in, in the court system and work alongside mental health court supports and uh, assist the individual um, because people with complex needs and uh, dual diagnosis or developmental disability, we really need to take that holistic multidisciplinary approach. And so we do uh, assist with coordination of alternative court resolutions with the mental health agency court support, so mental health diversions or diversions, discharge planning, central point of contact to connect with other services. But ultimately our goal is to ensure that the person, whether a victim, witness or accused, experiences the justice system in an equitable manner. And so we're very visual in our program. Um, so this is a visual of some of the roles or responsibilities of a DDJC, it's not an exhausted list. But some of the things that we would support an individual with would be uh, probation appointments, fingerprinting, uh, discharge planning with corrections, um, which is one was which was one of the talks that we heard uh, yesterday. Um, liaisons with justice professionals, and, and a major one that we're really trying to focus on and highlighting is education and training. And so we really want to start to build capacity with not only the client but the community, um, you know, support services. Uh, court support justice professionals. Um, and then we'll speak more towards um, the ABA specifics and ADBD uh, uh, when we speak about our program as a whole. And so as Marnie stated uh, originally in our presentation, to make a referral for the DDJC role, you would uh, contact uh, DSO and their website and number is there. Um, the individual must have a developmental disability or suspected uh, live in Ontario and be 18 years of age or older. Um, that being said, for the DDJC role, uh, we can take on clients that are pending eligibility, meaning that there's not a confirmed developmental disability, but it's suspected. So it's a process until they are deemed eligible, we can still get involved. And also um, any individual family or agency can approach the DSO if a client is 16 years of age. Um, because they can open up a file and still make uh, a referral for the DDJC role um, because they would be, de be deemed pending eligibility until they turn 18. So a lot of times we do uh, partner with court support, youth court support staff. And then I'll pass it over to Courtney for the clinical justice program. Thanks, Vicki. I'm happy to lead us off talking about the clinical justice program. And we are very visual, as Vicky said. So it's helpful sometimes just to have a bit of a timeline about how we got to this point. Um, so in 2018, we were lucky enough to enter in a, into a partnership between the CNSC and CLH Developmental Support Services and Center for Behavioral Health Sciences, Mackenzie Health. There's a million acronyms, so I apologize if we start referring to them as the acronyms as we go through, but the slides will always have full names. Um, but this partnership allowed us to create this dual role between our dual diagnosis justice coordinator and uh, someone that has a board certified behavior analyst designation. So that's Vicky. Uh, she started off wearing that dual hat that allowed us to do those skill acquisition and behavior intervention plans with the ABA lens. Um, from that, we had a lot of success. And in 2020, with addition of funding from the Central Local Health Integration Network or the LIN, we were able to bring on Samantha Earhart as our behavior consultant slash justice ABA specialist and really uh, hone that further and just reach more individuals. 
at that time as well, we started an adapted dialectical behavior therapy group or an ADBT group that allowed us to provide skills in emotion regulation, distress tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, and mindfulness to our justice involved clients. So this was really helpful if a lot of individuals required some type of programming in that area to complete their justice resolutions. So it was a great ad for us. And then in 2022, we were able to extend that further by bringing on Marnie Lai as our justice ADBT specialist. So she could expand those groups, um, just given the need and uh, the successes we are seeing so far. So at present, we have submitted a proposal for base funding for our program. Uh, we're, we're kind of working off the side of our desk still at this time, but we're always open to collaboration. So uh, if this is something as you see, as we move forward that you'd love to be a part of, please reach out to us. So again, with the visuals, this is our clinical justice program outlined for you here. Uh, just very briefly, pillar one is our justice clinic where we kind of house that ABA uh, components that we've spoken about. Pillar two is our ADBT justice group. Pillar three is our justice app. Pillar four are our clinical justice ABI resources. And pillar five, which is still in development, is our provincial justice training and education pillar but I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues to lead us through what each of those actually are and what they uh, entail. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you, Sam. Okay, I apologize everybody. My power went out one minute before the conference, this presentation started and my computer is not um, charged, so. I'm on my phone right now, <laughs> trying to do this presentation. Um, so like Courtney said, uh, I am the justice specialist, behavior consultant. And so primarily my role is in the justice clinic and pillar one. And so I create ABA justice plans or um, programming to help individuals with their court resolution, whether they're victims, witnesses, or accused individuals that have been charged. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but just to give uh, everybody an idea of some of the programming that I do do, um, rules and expectations of both in-person and virtual court, um, because as we know, individuals with developmental disabilities um, and complex needs, you know, that might not be something that they know or that they're aware of, or maybe they've never experienced court before, and so they're just very unfamiliar with it. Uh, decreasing behaviors in the courthouse rights and responsibilities of victim witnesses. I um, do a lot of work with victims and witnesses that have to testify at trials. I work collaboratively, co collaboratively with um, victim witness support program um, to help work with those individuals to prep them to testify and provide supports as well. I also do adapting and individualizing of mental health diversion curriculum as well. So anti-theft, anger management, boundaries, uh, I've also collaborated with PAR um, to help with individuals completing that programming as well. Um, peace bonds and like I said, um, probation order conditions as well. So not necessarily during charges, but sometimes after charges as well, just to ensure that they're maintaining um, the conditions that they have once their charges are completed. And then a referral for my role is a little bit different than the dual diagnosis justice coordinator role. Um, so we have a referral form that needs to be filled out and sent to the clinical justice team email. Um, once it's received, we will triage the request and um, based on capacity to support, we will support. Uh, I do want to mention a couple of quick things. So for my role, it's a little bit different. The individual doesn't need to be a part of Developmental Services Ontario. Um, so I can take individuals that aren't 18. Um, I can deal with children as well. Um, but they do need to have some sort of developmental disability or a brain injury. Thanks, Sam. So talk about living the adaptations piece, right? So I am really happy to speak about Pillar 2, the Adapted Dialectical Behavior Therapy Justice Group, because this is where I spend a lot of my time. And for the participants um, participating in our groups, the goal is to enhance coping skills in the areas of mindfulness, emotion regulation, distress tolerance, and interpersonal effectiveness. 
So our groups all run virtually and they run for 12 week sessions. Uh, and this would happen weekly and sessions run from anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half. All sessions would have two facilitators in them along with one participant observer who may be in there taking some data or just observing the session in general. Our co-facilitation team is comprised of a rotational multidisciplinary team member. So that would either be Courtney or Vicky or Sam. And then myself, I would be there every week uh, as the ADBT justice specialist. So sort of that one consistent uh, team member. Within the, the context of the group, we provide individual review as well as the one-on-one um, -on -one ADB, ADBT justice sessions. So if an individual requires extra support like booster sessions, for instance, or if we determine in some sort of pre-evaluation meetings that an individual may not be group ready, or perhaps their intellectual needs or communication needs are such that they need something a little bit more tailored or accommodated, then we will certainly make that accommodation or that adaptation, and we can provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, justice programming if necessary. Now, regardless whether you're one-on-one -on -one or you're participating in the group, all of our sessions would be structured the same, where we will always start with a mindfulness, we'll uh, provide a check-in with group members, and then we will review some skills teaching from the week before, jump into the current teaching for that day or week, and then we will always close with a mindfulness. Outside of this as well, because it is often highly encouraged, um, any members who are participating in group or one-on-one -on -one when possible, um, that they do have a support person in their life who attends with them. We find this is especially helpful for us, especially it, with it being a virtual platform, um, and then just for sort of that digital content, and then that follow-up outside of session time to assist with home practices or to ensure that they're practicing or generalizing skills in their everyday life. Um, and with all the pillars within the CJP, the nice thing about the ADBT uh, justice group is that it can be um, applied and worked simultaneously with all the other pillars as well. So much like a referral to our ABA specialist, the referral for the Justice ADBT programming would happen the same way. If you were querying whether an individual that you're working with might um, be appropriate for the program, you could send an email along to us uh, within the clinical justice program at the email here. Um, we will then take their request, um, perhaps request a little bit more information if necessary, and then we'll be able to triage that and see if um, this individual's uh, appropriate for the referral and if we have the capacity to support, but we always um, will aim to provide support whenever possible. Thank you, Marnie. And now we get to our Justice App Pillar, um, and we're very excited to announce that uh, this week, we were able to launch uh, the Justice App 2.0 um, with updated sections in the forensic system and incarceration. Um, and so if um, we did present on the Justice App at the last HSGCC, but if uh, you guys are not aware, uh, the Justice App is uh, a resource that we created to build capacity um, for uh, the community as a whole, client support staff uh, during the pandemic when uh, all the courthouses were closed and uh, in-person visits were not permitted. So it really outlines uh, information from first point of contact uh, with police all the way through the cr criminal justice system. And there is a, a case study throughout um, on an individual with a development disability. So uh, we do have a QR code um, uh, as well as the link there. And so you can access um, the Justice app through this QR code. Um, we also are excited to announce that we are in the works of getting it as a downloadable app in the Apple Store and Google Play. So um, for now, you can use the QR code or the link um, to get access to the app. Please leave any feedback or any suggestions. We're very open um, or any partnerships that uh, you want to establish uh, with the Justice App, you can reach out to us. Thanks, Vicki. So I'll speak a little bit to Pillar 4 as well, the Clinical Justice ABI Resources Pillar, because this is the other pillar where I spend the other half of my time. And within this pillar, we have a number of uh, goals and tasks that we always aim to complete. 
uh, one of which is to provide justice-focused skills and behavioral training that is adapted to support the neurodiverse needs of the many populations we serve. So being able to tailor justice supports or other supports in order to meet an individual where they're at. With that, and in order to do that, we feel that we need to be able to also build capacity amongst our community partners and the other service providers, which are many that we work with, um, being able to step into arenas where we can educate others on our support practices, but also to be open and willing to accept knowledge and expertise from other professionals that we're intersecting with. Um, this might mean um, sitting on situation tables, community situation tables, or I know our clinical justice program recently participated participated in the Catch-22 study that I know is being presented on here at the conference as well. With the individuals that we're working with directly as necessary, we can also within this pillar create justice-focused ABI resources as needed, whether it be identification cards or appointment reminders or any kind of visuals. As you know, we love visuals, so we can tailor uh, supports or visuals for individuals um, that we're supporting. Um, or this might also apply to service providers that we're working alongside. Maybe we can provide informational brochures to assist with some of the information between um, that intersection between ABI and the justice system. Another piece that's also been exciting within this pillar is that we've partnered with the Neurotrauma Care Pathways team, and we were invited to participate in their working group where they were working to um, develop better care pathways for individuals requiring some neurotrauma care. And from those collaborations, we were invited further to co-lead Central Region's Provincial ABI Initiative. And I was super lucky to be paired with Kathy Halovanek, who I know was presenting here this morning. Um, and uh, we've been tasked with coming up with a project or initiative that might help address some of those uh, identified gaps in navigation or education within that ABI sector. Um, so Kathy and I have paired ourselves with two uh, wonderful participant partners who have lived experience. And we've been working on a central resource library, which we've um, fondly called the Central Link. And uh, this resource, which we're currently working on, will be housed within the Neurotrauma Care Pathways website. And it'll be a resource that's available from all of us out to our bigger community, not only for central region, but hopefully across the province and growing maybe across the nation in order to support individuals with ABI further. This is just a quick little sample for you. I won't spend too much time here, but just some visuals so that you can have an idea of the brain injury identification cards that we've created or appointment reminders to support our clients, as well as an ABI justice resource, which we developed specifically for some justice contacts and, and, and uh, other support providers within the York region. Um, and we will be able to provide a copy of this a little further on in the presentation. So I won't take up too much time here. Thanks, Marnie. And I will close us off with pillar five, which as I stated at the, the onset is still in development, uh, but our intention is to create a uh, training module or full training uh, day offered for justice, uh, justice professionals, sorry. Uh, so all justice professionals that encounter individuals with developmental disabilities would be trained to support them in an individualized evidence and skill-based way. Uh, we also want to publish a corresponding manual to go alongside with that. It's also just a great resource to be able to refer back to. And then we seek to expand our justice clinical consultations that we're doing. These are ongoing and we do uh, student placements currently, but we just would like to expand that further. We've also been fortunate that the clinical justice program has been spotlighted in a few publications. So uh, we are featured in the Lawyers Daily. Uh, we were featured in the CLH DSS Foundation magazine, which you can see a visual of here on the right. Our justice app was added to the Georgian College curriculum and we were featured in the OASIS July 2022 newsletter. So as we said, we're always open to collaborations. And if anything you're hearing here sounds like something that you'd love to be a part of, please reach out to us after the presentation. So for the next little bit of our presentation, we're going to look at a case study of how our clinical justice program can really affect change uh, and support complex individuals that have justice involvement. So for the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna talk about Jerry. Um, all names and identifying information have been changed, but Jerry's a 31-year-old male. 
His diagnoses include Asperger's syndrome, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, attention deficit disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. While he has no adult criminal justice system involvement at the time that he was charged, he does have a youth criminal justice system record. Uh, he was living alone in an apartment and his only support from the developmental services side at the time of his arrest was his adult protective service worker. So he was largely living independent and without support. And he was charged with possession and accessing child pornography. So we were fortunate at the time um, when he was charged that I had worked with his adult protective service worker in the past. So she knew of our program and the referral from or sorry, the time from charge to when he was referred was pretty seamless. This allowed me to be able to support him during the bail stages uh, and then the ultimate release to his surety's home and making sure that he really understood his release condition. Uh, a lot of the times we find that folks don't understand what their actual release conditions are and that's a really easy way to get a breach and more charges. So that was kind of step one that we were able to get involved and help with. Then we completed his Legal Aid Ontario application and we were able to retain counsel. But I don't know if that May 2020 time is, is triggering anything for anyone, but as you can imagine, that was a couple months into COVID. And for those of you that had any experience with the justice system at that time, we were really struggling with basically a system that was set up to be pen and paper and in person, and then this need to pivot to a virtual platform due to the pandemic. So really from May 2020 to April 2021, not a whole heck of a lot happens for this individual, and it really wasn't their fault. The court was doing its adjournment process until we could get Zoom court up and running. Uh, there was a co-accused in this incident, so there was also that to contend with, as well as uh, further investigations that often occur when we're dealing with internet offenses. So there were some behind the scenes things going on at the time. So. We just continued to support Jerry. Um, but by April 2021, things were kind of back up and running a little bit more. And it was suggested that some upfront programming might be helpful to assist with a potential resolution in the courts. So at this time, I made the decision to connect him to our justice specialist, Sam, uh, for some applied behavior analysis programming on boundaries and consent. So I'll let Sam speak a little bit more to that component before we continue through. Thank you, Courtney. So like Courtney said, um, she put in a referral for my support. Um, so part of my involvement when I initially get involved is to conduct a functional assessment and gather some preliminary data. So I conducted the assessment. I gathered some preliminary data. Um, I actually looked through some boundaries content from CMHA and it, uh, further adapted that um, based on his needs, based on his assessment, based on what I felt like he needed to be able to learn best. Um, and then I created an individualized um, ABA justice plan to work on that boundaries and consent piece as part of his program. Um, for him, it was challenging and he really needed simplicity with the programming that I was going to work with him on. So I ended up um, breaking it up into two parts. So we would do part one once he was able to, you know, understand the information in part one, we moved to part two. And then once he was completed, um, you know, I wrote a certificate and I provided that um, and I he was discharged from my programming. But if we go to the next slide, I can show you a little bit of some of the adapted programming that I did with him for boundaries. So uh, a lot of my programming is virtual, depending on the individual, depending on the region, depending on the need. Um, and for him, I created PowerPoints. So PowerPoints with pictures and words were very helpful. For him, he was a visual learner, so the pictures helped him to retain the information. As you can see, very like simplistic information on the slides, um, and then really further conversation about all of those points when we would have our meetings. If we flip to the next one, you can kind of see, so we went through some different types of boundaries and boundaries that he can set, um, and just worked on this kind of content with him each week. So I would meet with him weekly, virtually, um, and we would go over this content each week until he was able to kind of, I felt like he was able to understand the information, tell me the information and retain it. Perfect, thank you, Sam. And what's really helpful about Sam's program is there's also data collected. So it's very helpful when we're going to a court and we're talking about like, we've done this program, but here's the actual concrete facts that this works. 
So while he was uh, continuing doing that programming with Sam, we were also doing some behind the scenes work at the DDJC. So uh, we completed a psychiatric consultation to evaluate if maybe a medication change was warranted. As we started working with this individual, it became very clear that they had been suffering in silence for a very long time and uh, needed more intervention than they had previously had. We also gathered letters of support. So I did one, his adult protective service worker did one, his surety, which was also a family member did one. And then this compiled with his certificate from Sam's program was given to the Crown Attorney. Um, they were very happy and pleased with the work that had been done at that time, but it was determined that there was still going to be more needed to support this person in some sort of an alternative resolution. So um, we, we needed more programming and we also needed supported housing because this may allow for the opportunity for this person to complete a house arrest sentence rather than a jail sentence that would be typically warranted with this level of offending. Um, so this is where I really did pull in my resources from the CMHA justice team to see if there was any community uh, housing resources we could explore. Uh, this is where we also worked really heavily with the adult protective service worker to explore local resources. And then at the same time, we're referring him to Marnie Lai, uh, her program, the Justice Adapted Dialectical Behavior Therapy Group that we were chatting about. Um, we were a little bit concerned about this individual having to do a group program, especially a virtual group program, because at this time of uh, our lives, virtual was still a little bit new for, for individuals. And he was ex exhibiting a lot of anxiety when he was in group situation. So we were able to make some accommodations to help with that. So um, when that anxiety was peaking, he was allowed to keep his camera off as opposed to having the camera on in group. We uh, we did like encourage all participants that they were able to use the chat function as another means of communicating or providing examples. And then for him specifically, we also had his support person in attendance with him and they were actually able to speak on his behalf if he chose that instead. So for example, if we posed a question, he might have whispered it to the support person and then the support person would vocalize it. But regardless, he was able to fully participate and that was quite exciting for him. Um, he successfully completed the group and he was awarded a certificate of completion stating that he had done this 12 week justice group. So that was another kind of tick in the programming component for us and really interesting throughout that group to see him utilize the skills that he had learned with Sam in, in that group in just terms of respecting other people's boundaries when they were speaking, um, just being more mindful. So that was, it was a cool crossover. So uh, as we kind of continue through this timeline, as I mentioned, we were working collaboratively with our community partners to see if there were some supportive housing options in the community we could access. But unfortunately, we were meeting a lot of resistance there. Also just a lack of resource, as I'm sure everyone around this virtual table realizes. Um, so then there was a decision made to present him at our local planning table. So to really highlight him to all of the developmental services uh, providers, around this table about his needs, what we were seeking, that there was really this missing like offense specific treatment component, um, and then also really looking for um, housing at the same time. So he went through the, the stages and the mechanisms to ultimately get the referral or the recommendation, sorry, at the regional level to move forward for a vacancy at an offense specific treatment home that we had on the DS side. You can go to the next slide, Vicki. Oh, sorry, one back. <laughs> so um, this is where I, I was able to really rely on the assistance of our other network positions. So our specialized transition coordinator, Cindy Evans. So while we work as our clinical justice program, we really do work in tandem with our other network team members. And Cindy was very pivotal in this component of our plan. Um, so we were able to kind of go through the steps for this group home placement, which included an assessment to see if one, he's appropriate. Um, if, if he was appropriate, which he was deemed to be, would he actually accept the offer to go to treatment, which thankfully he did and he wanted. Um, it's not often that we have somebody that's actually saying they want treatment and wants to go forward with it. So it was a really cool instance to see that come to fruition from him. Um, but then we kind of ran into this other hiccup. So at the onset of all of this, we're struggling with COVID delays and court. And now we're kind of in 2022 and a lot of agencies are struggling with staffing challenges. 
So for us, we actually found that his move in delay de de date, sorry, was delayed a few times just based on staffing challenges and really wanting to be able to provide him that fulsome support he needed when he did enter the treatment environment. So eventually in October 2022, he was able to move into the group home location, which was great news. Um, at this time, we still haven't finished anything in court. So he's still actively involved in the court process. Um, we kind of skimmed over it for the purposes of this presentation, but he had pled guilty to one of the charges and sentencing was delayed for him to be able to continue his programming and his treatment plan. Um, so basically, he, he was allowed the opportunity to get into the treatment home, settle, start his treatment plan, make sure that that was something that he was comfortable with and working towards. And then we came back to court in March of 2023. It was at that time that he was sentenced to two years less a day, so provincial time, that he was permitted to serve uh, as a house arrest, so on house arrest conditions. And this was a really interesting outcome for us as uh, with certain offenses, I'm sure some of you are aware of this, there is um, kind of an expectation about the type of outcome that's going to occur. And with the charges that Jerry faced, he typically would have been facing a jail sentence. He pled guilty, but still the sentencing outcome would have been pointing towards jail. And the judge in this instance decided that there were enough exceptional circumstances about him based on his developmental disability, his work with the clinical justice program, his ongoing commitment and enrollment in a treatment program that could last upwards of three years, if not longer, and those supports that we were able to bolster around him, that that met that exceptional circumstances threshold that permitted him to be able to serve his house rest condition as opposed to a jail condition. Once that is finished, he's going to be then bound by a three-year probation order. So um, that, that makes him a high-risk probation client. So he will have some uh, regular reporting and the corresponding supports that go along with that. But this was really an interesting case that we wanted to highlight as it shows how all different areas of our clinical justice program were able to work together to ensure that the person had the best possible outcome that he was able to meaningfully participate in his justice process, no matter how long it took, considering all the delays that weren't even uh, his fault, that he was able to get the appropriate supports and treatment, whereas jail time wouldn't have been able to provide what he needed. So just in terms of moving parts, I mean, I think Courtney highlighted this very nicely that, you know, for Jerry, we used a lot of different pillars of our clinical justice program. And I think it just goes to show that, you know, not just one pillar can be helpful, but multiple different pillars can really help to create, in Jerry's case, the, the best possible outcome that I think he could get. Um, so, you know, in, in his case, we used, you know, the Justice app, the ADBT Justice Group, as well as my programming, um, so that, you know, he could achieve the best possible outcome, which is the house arrest instead of jail time. So I'm sure everybody's wondering, you know, where is he now? Um, so he's currently residing in a treatment home. He's still residing in the treatment home, still actively engaging in treatment, outings, and participating in his house arrest conditions. Uh, Courtney still continues to participate in review meetings and be available as needed. Um, and one thing that I think is really important and I really want to highlight too is that all the programming that we did through the ADBT Justice Group, uh, as well as the ABA programming that I completed with him are available as resources along with the Justice app for him if he ever needs it. So we really make sure that, you know, they're connected to supports and that those supports are aware of the programming that we're providing so that it can be something that's ongoing. So it's not that he completed my programming and it's done and he'll never look at it again or that we complete the ADBT group and it's done. It's something that's ongoing. It's something that the support people around the individuals are aware of and that they're able to use going forward as they continue to move through their journey of life.
Thank you, Sam and Courtney. So as promised to close off, and I am definitely cognizant of time, we want to give everybody time for some questions as well, if you have them. We wanted to share with you some resources and some tip sheets. Um, the first one, so as stated, we had developed a uh, Acquire Brain Injury ABI justice resource upon the request um, and the need that we observed for some justice professionals within the York area. I appreciate many are attending this conference across the province. So what we did is we um, adapted this resource so that we could make it a little bit more provincially friendly. And we've um, created it in a PDF two page type uh, format. Um, and this will be shared when the slides are shared through the HSJCC coordinators um, with everyone. So we hope that this will be a resource that you can uh, use for yourselves in your practice or certainly share with individuals you support. The appointment reminders and the brain injury identification card will also be accessible through there. And thank you. And then we also created a one page, uh, nice informational with all the info that you'll need in regards to the Justice app. Um, I can't say enough great things about this resource. Uh, I've seen it uh, utilized and, and support a number of different individuals, whether they're the individual themselves uh, interacting with the justice system or whether they're a support professional inside and outside of the justice system supporting someone um, or a caregiver perhaps or support person for an individual. It's a tremendous resource and I know it's continuing to grow. There's so many goals um, in order to expand upon it, including um, working on another one where we're adding uh, or in addition to some information on forensic systems and the incarceration systems. So please do uh, stay tuned and, and utilize this, this great resource. Uh, we've also created, um, just checking my time here, uh, an inclusive justice tip sheet, which um, we thought might be helpful to share. So this is just a summary of some of the effective support practices that we've used with individuals that we support. And we thought it would be good to highlight and share them with you all, because I think that these are applicable for all of us uh, working within the justice system, but even outside of that. Um, and the first one is to ensure that we're all promoting equitable engagement in the justice process for those individuals. So our thought is always that the justice process should be happening with an individual, not to the individual. And in order to ensure that, we want to make sure that we're communicating effectively. So meeting the individual where they're at, meeting their communication needs. So maybe that means using more simplified language, uh, checking comprehension when information is given, um, or even acting as an interpreter, if you will, at times. To do that, we also um, might need to provide visuals or written instructions. The Justice app, again, can be a great tool for this or adding those reminders uh, if necessary, being able to break down uh, information into smaller chunks um, for individuals can often be really helpful. We also want to make sure that we're maximizing their success and their engagement with the process. So maybe that means assisting with coordinating tasks within that justice process. So for instance, if an individual has to report in person, maybe they need some assistance arranging transportation or making sure that any documents they're required to bring with them are collected and collated um, or monitoring app appointments from inside and outside. Um, just to ensure that that information is, is, is being collected, is being shared, and this individual feels supported. Um, to do that, obviously, um, you know, we don't work in silos and we can't work alone. So when possible, we want to be able to include family members, if available, or other personal support systems in that individual's life um, to work with them in the process. Another piece, and we've heard it talked about a lot through multiple different talks over the last few days, is the importance of screening for comorbidities. Um, so being able to use that biopsychosocial lens so that we're really um, supporting the whole person and we're getting curious about what other supports this individual might need. Once we do that, it allows us to better link an individual to community resources for ongoing or long-term supports. Um, you know, once the justice matters close, we want to ensure that the person that we've supported has some takeaways or an ongoing connection which in the community, um, which extends beyond that justice system. And to do that, we can't say enough about the importance of collaboration, building capacity, and when necessary, sort of working up at that systems level so that we can collaborate, get creative, um, bridge gaps, and advocate whenever we can. 
So a huge thank you to everyone on behalf of all of us here um, for joining us. We hope that we can all continue to be innovative in providing advocacy and support to um, all individuals that we have the pleasure of working with, uh, whether this means being creative in our programming to try to fill those gaps. Um, we certainly know that we need to be flexible in providing programming and ensuring that we provide individualized and client-centered approaches is so key. And again, that special point on collaboration, collaborating with each other, our community par partners um, within our day-to-day -day work or in opportunities such as this, just to ensure that we're doing all that we can to make sure that people who are intersecting with the justice system have equitable access to it. So with that last note, um, I will open it up for questions. And once again, thank you everybody for your time on behalf of the Clinical Justice Program. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation. I, I just want to say that as a person who thinks about housing policy, the intersections are are so amazing to see, like even just trying to help that one individual without having access to supportive housing, really, really difficult. Um, but thank you for all of the great work that you do. Uh, for questions, um, you can either pop your question in the chat. Uh, thanks to Shaley for your first question there. Um, but also, please feel free to use the raise hand function if you want to ask a question uh, with your mouth. And, uh, so if the first question that we have uh, here from Shaley is, how do you overcome challenges when trying to work with a person's lawyer or probation officer, but you hit roadblocks? I can start us off and then maybe others can chime in. Um, I, I think just being present and reaching out um, um, to the the lawyer or the probation officer um, and just seeing if anything is needed from our end. Um, we attend a, a lot of the appointments with the, the client with their lawyer um, as well as probation. And so a lot of times once they see the interaction or how we can assist, um, I find it's easier that um, that collaboration and the open communication starts. And I always joke with the team that it's just one client at a time. So once we can get you know, um, those partnerships fostered and the relationships with one lawyer at a time, with one client at a time. Once we get the work out, then word out, then we start getting referrals from that same lawyer. Um, I'll, I'll pass it over to the team, but just being present and open-minded and, and just continuing to offer your support and what has maybe been helpful in the past with some of the lawyers. So we give examples of in the past, this is what we've done to support. Um, and a lot of times then, then they will... Um, sort of start, start the relationship and collaborating. Yeah, just to add to what Vicky said, I think it all just comes back to building capacity. So that's always a goal of ours here. And uh, once you kind of demonstrate what we can do and what those outcomes can actually be for clients, I think you, you do have a lot more people reaching out and making referrals. I was really fortunate in my area that I came from the corrections and CMHA side. So thankfully had a bunch of resources on that side. And I know Vicki and I used to have lots of conversations about like, how do we duplicate that in all areas? And that's exactly what we did is we just showed that the work works and that it does um, really change the lives of the individuals we support. And like we said, we're always open to collaborations. So um, I think just keeping that door open is what helps. Thanks so much for that. Uh, my next question. Um, how do you manage uh, acquired brain injury and developmental disability when it comes to showing up for appointments, falling through on conditions, etc.? I'm happy to take this one. And I think it lends itself to the idea that we were talking about, uh, about creating resources and supports within. So whether there's things that we can do to tailor our approaches, to adapt our supports in order to meet someone where they're at, involving other support professionals who um, might be in their life already, educating them on the effects of an acquired brain injury perhaps, um, and then making sure that the individual feels supported both within the justice system and outside of that. 
Um, I know there's a number of great uh, resources out there, but as stated, and I think it's been a theme going on and Vicki touched on it too, um, collaboration, educating community partners even ahead of time. So doing the upfront work. So even if you have an individual who's not currently on your caseload requiring that support, it's still about educating. It's still about talking and collaborating, having those conversations. So if that need or intersection um, does come up, we're prepared um, and, and being able to sort of run that marathon, right? Not giving up, continuing to have those conversations and to advocate and push when necessary. Anyone else want to jump in on that one or move on to the next one? I think Marnie answered it pretty perfectly. So maybe in the absence of time, we can take some other questions. Um, great. Um, someone asked if there, if this is, um, just because their services like this are available across the province. I just had my mic on, so I guess I'll take this one, you guys. Um, so we do have community networks with specialized care all across the province. Um, I'm actually the co-chair of our dual diagnosis justice coordinators and case managers across the province. So if you are thinking that you need support in the justice area for this population and you're not sure who to reach out to, um, feel free to reach out to me and I can link you to the appropriate person. Uh, our clinical justice program itself is a Central East resource, but thankfully due to our virtual world we live in now, we do have some capacity to support and provide that clinical consultation across the province. So. Like we said, we're always open to having conversations. So if you think of something that would be of benefit to you or the folks you support, please reach out. You're getting Can some I excellent shout outs in the chat there. <laughs> I just wanna add to, um, I've done a lot of work with victim witness support programs outside of the Central East region as well. Um, so it's not necessarily something that like Courtney said, you know, you can always shoot us a line and see if we are able to support or what capacity we're able to support or what we can help kind of coordinate with. It's great to hear. It helps too, if I could add one more piece about the ABI question. Mm -hmm. and sort of in line with us kind of getting curious as support providers a little bit. So developmental services Ontario. So although um, the individuals that we support have a dual diagnosis, so there's a present of a developmental disability, what some people um, may not be aware of is that it, if a brain injury is sustained prior to the age of 18, it, it may be considered a developmental disability in nature, which means if an individual has cognitive and adaptive limitations as a result of their injury, and this occurred prior to the age of 18, if it can be considered a developmental disability, which again can be queried through Developmental Services Ontario, I think it's a really important resource to tap into because it can open up a whole other ministry of supports for that individual. So I just want to um, mention that out there because I know we, within our program, always keep that in the back of our minds to see if there's other ways that we might support an individual. Or even if the acquired brain injury was sustained after the age of 18, but you suspect that there may be a history of developmental disability based on statements they're making, it's still worth a query. Um, because again, any pockets of resources or supports that we can plug into, the better. Thank you so much for that. And, and that's a, a really important point to make, I think. Um, if we have no more questions, not seeing any more questions, I'm going to pass it back over to Lucy. Oh, one more question. Right under the wire. Go ahead. Hi, sorry. Um, so I know for that in terms of the Northern region, which I'm um, Thunder Bay in, in area, that we really don't, we don't have your program here at all. So, um, but that doesn't mean that, I mean, we still have a forensic unit that we provide supports for that a behavior consultant is involved with. But what we find sometimes is a bit of a struggle is getting that buy-in in terms of how do we best support the individual with special needs when they're already on a forensic unit and they, have already kind of gone through some of of the system and in, now they're trying to figure out how to transition them out of that out of off the unit into say a group home or um you know in the in within the community 
any suggestions or ideas on what that should look like? Like I'm, I'm looking at some of the stuff that you guys are doing. I'm thinking, Oh my God, I would love to have that resource. Cause one of the things we're looking at doing is, is opening a DD trip home for some of these individuals. So a lot of that stuff might not be able to get in when they're in the unit, but we could possibly support them outside in the home with some of that information. So I'm just curious, like, what are your thoughts on, on all that? I can I go. I, oh, you want to oh, go, go ahead? ahead. <laughs> I can start in if Sam wants to add to like the behavior consulting component of it. And then Courtney, if you want to add um, for the other pieces, but I think um, as a behavior consultant in that environment, you, you're really limited on how the person will present in the community. Um, that being said, uh, you can still work on some skills um, while they are in an, a controlled environment. And sometimes that is good that you build on their skills within the controlled environment. And then when the transition happens, there needs to be that open line of communication from the behavior consultant or behavior tech or therapist within the forensic system and a community support uh, for behavior supports in the in outside. So a smooth transition. Um, and so uh, if we know that the individual is transitioning, then, then I urge you to connect with your local behavioral supports um, and see how you guys can facilitate a referral while they are in the forensic system and then transitioning out. And then they could probably also guide you and assist with a transition plan um, as well. I hate to cut things off. We are over time. Uh, so I just wanted to reiterate that we do have the opportunity because everybody's profile and your emails are here. Thank you for that presenters. So if you do have additional questions that weren't answered today, please feel free to send a message to our presenters here uh, for follow-up. And of course it's all about connections. So uh, I anticipate they'll be networking far along after this uh, presentation. So thank you very much to our presenters and thank you to those who answered and asked questions. Uh, there is an evaluation. The link is at the bottom of this session page. Please do take a few minutes to fill that out. Um, and I want to invite everybody to come back into the main room for our day two closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest. Thanks. Thanks everyone.